I currently live in a little town out west. Well, I say town. Not exactly what you picture, though. It's more of a ghost town than anything, really. Population? Four. The only businesses that are open are the post office, the library, a singular, privately owned pharmacy, a gas station, and a hotel. The Hotel Bellamerte. I've worked there for the better part of a century, ever since I was 21. Unlike most kids my age who jump straight out of high school and into college, I had other plans. Or should I say, other plans had me. I lived in the town over from the previously mentioned one. A town that had far more people and businesses. I worked from place to place for a couple of years. Nothing substantial. But it paid the bills. One day I came home from work, picked up my mail, and headed inside my house. As I brewed a fresh pot of coffee, I absentmindedly flipped through the mail. Bills and junk mail were all I ever seemed to get. But then, I hit the second to last piece of mail and it felt, well, odd. It's hard to describe, but the letter felt ornate, to say the least. It had a thick texture, made from what I could only imagine was some pretty expensive paper. In the most beautiful flowing script was printed my name clear as day. Autumn Winters. I had no return address and it didn't have my address either, just my name. The fact that someone knew me intimately enough to hand deliver a letter to me without me knowing was a strange thought to me. I had very few friends because I grew up an army brat, and only a handful of people knew me well enough to actually know where I lived. Out of sheer curiosity, I then proceeded to open the letter. On the finest of parchment paper, in the most delicate letterhead, read the following words. Dear Miss Autumn Winters, I'm writing to offer you the most prestigious position at our establishment, the Hotel Bellamerte. For over 200 years, our establishment has been a haven for the weary and restless, the old, the young, and forgotten, the men, women, and animals alike. Recently, we've had an opening for a new caretaker, I would like to offer the position to you. The letter went on to say that along with the position, a hotel room and small apartment came with the job. Along with a salary, four times what I was currently making a year. The name of the hotel seemed familiar, yet everything about the letter and position seemed way too good to be true. Like a scam. That's when I noticed at the bottom of the job offer was the address. That, my friends, was when my interest was truly piqued. It was only one town over. And that's when it all started clicking in my head. The Hotel Bellamerte. Ever since I could remember, there have been rumors and stories about the hotel. Strange tales that seemed too odd to be true. Tales of ghosts, strange travelers, and more. We heard the rumors, sure. But few people I knew actually believed them. The kids in the town I lived in would say that if you set foot in the hotel, you would be driven to madness and go loco. The tales were just so bizarre. How could we believe them? So after a few days of deliberating, I wrote back accepting the job opportunity. I got a letter back a few days later to congratulate me and set the start date. I was to start the next Monday, around noonish. As I got ready that following Monday, I put on my best clothes, did my makeup, hair, you know, the girly things. Tripped over thin air as I went to the kitchen to get my coffee going. Then got in my 1965 red convertible Mustang and made the short drive. On the way into town, I passed by, well, nothing. The land is completely barren outside the town I grew up in, except for the tumbleweeds, brush and bracken that looked perfect to start a brush fire with and the few twisted, gnarled elder trees that once stood tall, perhaps, but now were nothing more than a sorry shadow of what they used to be. Think typical Western movie scenes? Yeah, that's it. The town that held the hotel looked much more of the same, with run-down buildings that barely could be considered standing. The further into the ghost town you got, the more lifelike things became. The gas station was the first thing that looked like it held any living beings. The pharmacy was next, then the library, 
and the post office. They were all about equal in size, too. Looked just as run down as the other, with peeling paint that fell in ribbons to the ground. When the wind was strong and acting up, and suddenly I saw it for the first time. The Hotel Bellamerte, live and in person. And it didn't even compare to what I had in mind. You see, when I pictured it, I thought of a rundown building, filled with cockroaches and rats, with only the lowest kind of people staying there. You know, the kind of place that police did stakeouts at? To bust drug dealers and hookers. What other kind of place would be in this rundown town? But I was so, so wrong. The sight that greeted me as I pulled up to the parking lot of the place was one I could barely believe. The hotel was in a word. Magnificent. It looked like it belonged in a fancy city, not a barren wasteland. The outside of the hotel for the town in the time period of the 1800s, with a high-rise balcony and white pillars that stood tall and straight. The brickwork was perfectly inlaid, faded red in color due to the wear and tear of time, yet still hardy in structure. I imagine it looked only a little better in its heyday, if nothing else than for its newness. Whoever owned the building took great care of it. Whether in restoration or simple upkeep, it was something to see for sure. As I got out of my car and walked up the front steps, admiring all the intricate woodwork that went into the structure, I looked above the front door and read the sign. The Hotel Bellamerte, established 1802. I turned the knob of the old door. No creaks or groans, just silence as the door pivoted on its hinges and walked inside. Now, as impressed as I was with the outside of the place, it didn't even compare to what was before my eyes. As you entered into the lobby, the first thing that would come to attention was the grand staircase, made of beautiful mahogany wood, rich in cherry brown undertones, swooping as it dipped from its height down to the floor. To the left, I became aware of the lobby desk. It was the same type of wood as the staircase, with intricate designs that swirled down its length, carved out by some long dead carpenter. Behind the desk were the letter boxes, with the numbers carefully and expertly placed in their centers, numbered from 1 to 15. The parlor was to the right. It looked as though it was frozen in time, like the rest of the place, with old furniture, with floral designs and high backs, to the wallpaper that looked much of the same. It was stupendous. After I had gotten done admiring the lobby, I slowly walked over to the desk. No one was there. Not a single soul. I rang the bell on the counter, yet no one came. And after a few minutes of waiting, I called out a, Hello? Still, no one came. I began to wonder what I should do next. In our correspondence, I never got a number, despite noticing an old rotary phone on the desk near the letterboxes. Then I also realized I actually never got a name of the person I was corresponding with. I didn't even know who my employer was. As I grappled with this realization, the phone began to ring, breaking the silence. I almost jumped out of my skin, scared shitless by the loud ringing in the otherwise quiet room. After no one magically appearing to answer it, it fell silent after the fourth ring only to begin ringing once more. After regaining my composure, I walked around the desk to the back, looking around as I did so, and feeling as if I were a child about to be caught with my hand in the cookie jar, and picked up the phone. Hello? I answered slowly. Yes, is this Autumn? Yes, yes it is, I replied. Who is this? I'm the owner, Mary, and my sister Martha is also on the phone, the voice said. Oh, hi, I said, stunned by the fact that the owners called instead of actually being there in person to greet me. Are you coming by or are you here somewhere? No, oh, no, hon, we aren't there. We're never at the hotel. That, that would be ridiculous. 
Mary said as her sister Martha chimed in in the background. Oh, yes, that is terribly ridiculous, she said, giggling. Oh, okay, I said, now terribly confused. No, no, we're just calling to let you know there's a letter with your instructions for the job next to the phone. And to let you know that we will be checking in from time to time. You are the only employee. The last one left us a bit, well, shall we say, unexpectedly. The last one. What does that mean, the last one? She said that as if there were a series of ones. Well, I take it that means I'm starting immediately then? We wouldn't have it any other way, love, Martha replied. Everything you'll need to know to run the place is in the letter. Just make sure you read everything and don't skip anything, Mary added. Then both in unison said, We'll be in touch, dear, as they hung up the phone. I was a little weirded out by the entire conversation, to be honest. It seemed callous, yet rushed, despite the cheery nature of their voices and reactions. And the weird pet names, of course. I looked at the table next to the phone. As the sisters had said, there was a letter. I opened it quickly, with the ornate silver letter opener conveniently placed in the first drawer I happened to look through. Out from the envelope popped a long, and I mean, two-foot letter, made of the same parchment paper as my offer letter had been on. As I started to read through it, I became increasingly confused and worried. What had I gotten myself into? The letter started out normally enough. It outlined the general duties of the job, how to receive payment, $50 per night. Stunningly low, I thought, for such a place as this. But I've never been in the hotel business, and I wouldn't know otherwise. Housekeeping, even down to the way they wanted the toilet paper changed. The wrong way, with the paper going under the rule, but who am I to judge? Last but not least was written a long set of rules that honestly made no sense. Written in bold red print were the following set of rules. Uh, rule number 126. Never forget to lock the doors at night. You don't want to let them in. Rule number 27. Make sure you feed Jesus every night or else. Rule number 128. Only take the trash out in daylight hours. Rule 129. Make sure you face the dolls in the doll room facing at the wall at night. Okay. Rule 130. Don't ever take candy from the pharmacist. Okay, got it. Rule 131. Never return a book late to the librarian. All right, seems fair. Rule 132. Always lick the stamps in the presence of the postman. Okay, that, that's a little weird. Rule 133. Never, ever leave the town under any circumstances or you'll regret it. And that was that. Not threatening at all or bizarre, or extremely specific at all. Just a normal set of rules that made the place seem a little more undesirable. Now I was really thinking I had gotten myself into something, and not something good. And yet, I was thoroughly intrigued. I mean, what happens if I leave the town? Why did I have to lock the doors at night, and who was them? And why did I have to take the trash out during the day? Who the hell was Jesus? Nothing made sense. Since I was going to be there a while, I decided I might as well settle in. I looked at the letter again, and at the end was my room number, and in the envelope was my room key. Room number 16. Turned out there was one extra room in the hotel. After I got the key, I put the letter back in its prior place and turned to walk up the stairs to explore what was going to be my new home. The doors on the second floor spanned three hallways and a dining room attached to the kitchen. Each room numbered 1 through 16, alternating going from the left side of the hallway and then adjacent to the room on the right and back again. The walls seemed to ever expand and contract at the same time if you stood in one place for too long. A dizzying effect, to be sure. It reminded me of The Shining. No thank you. As I walked the halls, reaching the dining room, I passed by and I could have sworn I saw a dark shadow pass by the half-open door, but when I looked inside, there was nothing. There were only tables and chairs and waiting tables lining the walls. 
Strange, I thought, but I just shrugged it off and continued down the hall. Number 13, 14, 15. Ah, here's room 16. As I jiggled the old skeleton key in its lock, there appeared to be a slight mumbling coming from the other side of the door. I promptly stopped to listen, but there was nothing, not a single solitary sound. So I proceeded to open the door once unlocked. My room, like the rest of the place, was absolutely beautiful. The queen-size bed with the ornate canopy, all white billowing in the soft breeze from the open window, stood on the left-hand side of the room toward the middle of the length of the wall. The small sitting area was to the right with a wardrobe, small couch, and two high-backed chairs of the same make as those in the sitting room downstairs. Same floral patterns and everything. The open balcony windows were straight ahead. As I walked to them, I became all too aware of the mumbling again. I spun around quickly to see that in the corner of the right side of the room was a bird's perch and cage. And when I say bird, I don't mean a parrot or a cockatoo or even a parakeet or a finch. What I saw sitting there was a raven, and it was talking. Just strange phrases and random words, but human words nonetheless. I began to approach the bird and it let out a loud squawk and began to flap its wings and flew straight into my face, blinding me for a second. Now, I think it would be fair to mention for visual sake that I hate birds. Yes, they are or can be pretty. Yes, they have beautiful songs and musical notes that they chipperly sing out. And yes, they perhaps can make good companions for some people. I, however, am not one of those people, and I especially hate when they're little or in this case, big flappy wings come flying in my face or near me in my visual field. So of course I screamed out loud, which only made it squawk louder with its horrible croaky voice. Then, as soon as it had hit me, it flew away. I took my arms down after a moment once I knew it was gone, which had been trying to shield my face and begun to look around the room. No bird in sight. Had I just dreamed I saw that too? Or was I starting to go loco in that hotel as the many rumors from my childhood had said you would go if you stepped inside? After calming down a bit, I began to shrug off the fear and replaced it with the determination to settle in and set up the room with my things. Once I had finished, at the exact moment, I put the last pair of pants in the wardrobe. I heard a strange sound, a little ding. And that's when I realized I heard the bell from downstairs. Someone was in the lobby.